Australian Special Forces units have the longest presence in Australia's longest war. They were there soon after United States forces drove Al-Qaeda from these mountains 10 years ago. And they are here in Afghanistan still. But for all of those 10 years, what they do and how they do it has been kept largely secret. The core of every, every guy within SASR that's to, in part, to strive for excellence in, in everything they do at all times, whether there's someone watching or not, whether there's going to be recognition or not. Kept secret until now. Here we join Australia's elite Special Air Service Regiment, the SASR. It's not about talking themselves up or anything like that, it's just about getting on with the job. Their brothers in arms, the commandos, also overcome acute camera shyness, taking us with them in pursuit of a Taliban commander. I will go out there and we'll face Taliban every day, put me in front of a camera or I'll shoot myself. <laughs> on the way here, plans changed. They heard on the radio that the Taliban commander was confirmed to be here in this motorcycle shop. So. Plans changed and uh, the combat forces rushed this location. They're now searching a whole range of uh, local fighting age males. They say that they've already identified uh, an IED facilitator. I think in the trade, that's called a jackpot. Don't get off the path. Complementing the commandos and the SASR is the Incident Response Regiment the combat engineers out in front who uncover the weapons caches, booby traps and hidden mines. Holy shit. I've had that twice where I've thought, I honestly thought to myself, is that next step the, uh, the step worth taking? The different force elements merge to make up Rotation 16 of Australia's Special Operations Task Group a truly unique band known throughout Afghanistan as Task Force 66. Free protection, let's go, facing that way. At the end of the day, we are just everyday people. We come to work, we do our work, and then we go home with our families. It's not like the movies. We do a job and we just get on with the job. Go, go, go. We're getting hit from here too. Who's shooting? I'm gonna take a shit, I ain't gonna shit us up. The Afghanistan home for Australia's Special Operations Task Group is at Taran Kot, in the sparse, rugged and largely primitive Uruzgan province. Special Forces is secreted in a fortress within a fortress at Camp Russell, named in honour of Sergeant Andrew Russell, the first Australian soldier killed in Afghanistan. We are allowed to move freely among the soldiers, and ask what we like with no one looking over the shoulders. But there are restrictions. For the most part, we can't identify them. We've also agreed to avoid exposing trade secrets, what they call their tactics, techniques and procedures. And the fact that we're so secretive by necessity for how we do business means that a lot of, uh, a lot of speculation can go on. But you will be taken to their battlefield. Where are they? Top of the feature, one you will see what they see. And you will hear their views on the war they fight. This is not like any war we've been in previously, and we're trying to do it right. Some of the soldiers we join are veterans of multiple rotations. This commando won a Medal of Gallantry for an action that saw the death of a comrade, Luke Worsley, in November 2007. The contact one of thousands exemplifies the complexity of a war with no front line or neutral space. Yeah. 
zero five one. Just tango four one. We just engaged two enemy in the uh, in the alleyway. Stand by for fire support. Jesus. In 10 years of operations, Special Forces has accumulated 40 bravery medals, including two Victoria Crosses. In 2007, this young corporal scaled a mountain to enter the lion's den, in this case a cave of a Taliban commander. Uh, when I locked eyes, uh, he locked eyes with me, it was approximately you know, 10 metres. Uh, I could notice that he had a weapon down the side of him, and uh, it was uh, essentially uh, both weapons up, and it was who was the quickest to the trigger. This soldier is one of many to return to battle bearing the scars of previous combat. Our lead scout was shot and I also received uh, a rounds hit my personal weapon and then uh, fragments went through my face, through my ear. There was a lot of blood. Obviously, uh, your head injuries bleed a lot more than anywhere else on the body. Um, I crawled over to the, to the medic just to make sure that it was nothing vital. And uh, once he gave me the thumbs up, we, we continued on with the fight. Holy... The battlefield's changed significantly. Uh, I believe the threat has become far more complex. Uh, the, the, the Taliban and insurgent commanders have, have accurately realised that their strength is their ability at times to move within the population. Uh, and you've also seen the emergence of the IED threat uh, over the years. Uh, and that IED threat provides, you know, provides a lot of challenges as, as much for the local population and the local law enforcement as it does for us. The SAS head out, attending to their main business, counter leadership, or what some have come to term, kill capture. You looked at our processes and we felt that kill capture were, was an inappropriate term. Um, it was an inaccurate term, in fact. Uh, it implies that um, it's, as, it's as simple and black and white as that. We seek to neutralise a commander and we remain, um, you know, we, we do a lot of analysis into what the best method of that neutralisation might be. The helicopter enables further reach to Kaz Uruzgan, which has seen a lot of fighting. In August, an Australian soldier, Private Matthew Lambert, had been killed by an IED. In the following weeks, the SAS returned to Kazura's gun, and on September 10, they hit what they called a jackpot, killing three further insurgents and a master bomb maker, Mullah Abdul Qadir. The Taliban leader had commanded a cell of 30 fighters in the area. Uh, that particular insurgent commander had been active uh, in Uruzgan for about two and a half, three years uh, and had a lot of linkages to um, uh, the Kasuruzgan district. The force element had interrupted a shura or meeting returning also with a cache of weaponry. The significance of this particular weapon is it's an AKS-74. Uh, and AK-74 are a Soviet-era weapon, and in Afghanistan they're reasonably uncommon. So those insurgent commanders that we come across, they're in possession of them, it's an indication of their seniority. It's seen as a, a status symbol, um, and they're also worth a lot of money, so therefore uh, a low-level insurgent is, is very unlikely to be in possession of one of these weapons. The Taliban leader, codenamed JDAM, had been on the JPEL, or Joint Priority Effects list. The effective hit list has attracted criticism that it hardens and further radicalises the Taliban and that the coalition gets it wrong. If there's ever a, a, an allegation that comes through that, that, that we've done the wrong thing, there's something that not only the regiment but, but the individual soldiers take very seriously and it weighs very heavily on guys' minds. While most of the fighting takes place outside the wire, it's not as if the main base escapes attack. From the closer range of hills, insurgents regularly fire rockets, largely aimed at the coalition's terror weapon, the helicopter. The 107 rockets are generally set on a crude timer, so the insurgents can be gone before the coalition's immense firepower turns on them. You know, now we've got a, uh, a counter rocket mortar a device set up there which has got 360 degree and 24 hours a day coverage of uh, incoming uh, rockets and mortars.
In the early evening, sensors pick up signs of an imminent rocket attack. We are near the flight line as we hit the ground. Two rockets strike, generating more noise than harm. Locate a squeal if you want to. There's some close call stories about people who decided they needed to go for a piss in the middle of the night or got up, got up to go for a smoke and the rocket lands and it's landed in their bed space. So there's a few close calls. The Special Operations Task Group is mostly male and mostly it works outside the wire. It's small enough to be close. Females make up 5% of the company of 300. Headquarters remains in close contact. Look, it's, it's definitely not a video game. It's not, you know, this is, this is life and death uh, uh, sort of stuff. So it's not, um, it's not something that you can, uh, you can pause and replay. The prospect of not coming back has to be on the minds of some of these men as they board two Australian CH-47s. It's always tense when there's an incident going on outside the wire. I think everybody picks up on that emotion. The Taliban has been heard on radio relaying warnings to not fire at the elephants, as they call the Australian Chinooks, which can reply with 4,000 rounds a minute. Next, we see for ourselves the immense responsibility that accompanies the immense firepower in the hands of young soldiers.